Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ayşe Çubukçu. I'm an associate professor in human rights and co-director of LSE Human Rights here at the London School of Economics. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the school for our annual Human Rights Day lecture and introduce our speaker tonight, Professor Kimberly Hutchings. Uh, now, before we proceed, first, please allow me to do, uh, extend warm thanks to Dr. Mahvish Ahmad, Mehdi Giles, and Laura Wayne in the back, and the LSE events team for all their work in making tonight's lecture and conversation possible. Now, uh, we're thrilled indeed to host Professor Hutchings for our annual Human, uh, hu Human Rights Day lecture this year and welcome her back to the LSE, where she taught for many years, from 2004, uh, three, to 2014 in the Department of International Relations. I'm not sure if she would remember this, but she actually interviewed me for this job in 2011 um, as the head of department for international relations. Uh, now, the scholarship of Professor Hutchings will require no introduction for many people in the audience today. Uh, nevertheless, let me say a few words about her prolific tenure as a scholar of international relations and as a political theorist. I would call her a political philosopher, actually. I don't know if she would agree with the designation. Uh, professor Hutchings is currently Professor of Politics and International Relations at Queen Mary, University of London, and her research interests encompass international uh, political and ethical theory, as well as feminist and critical philosophy. Her many books include Kant's Critique and Politics, published in 1996, International Political Theory, which was published in 1998, Hegel and Feminist Philosophy, published in 2003, Time and World Politics, which was published in 2008, Global Ethics and Introduction, the second edition of which was published in 2018, Violence and Political Theory, uh, which was published in 2020 and co-authored with Elizabeth Fraser, and the groundbreaking volume, much overdue, but they've done it, Women's International Thought Towards a New Canon, which she co-edited with Patricia Owens, Katerina Reisler, and Sarah Dunstan in 2022. Uh, Professor Hutchings is one of the sharpest and most generous scholars that I have ever met, met, in fact, and she's been awarded and recognized as the inaugural British International Studies Prize for Distinguished Contribution to the Profession in 2015. She was also awarded this year, in 2023, the Political Studies Association Azaya Berlin Prize for her, quote, outstanding lifetime professional contribution to political studies. Tonight, uh, the title of Professor Hutchings' very much anticipated lecture is Rights, Virtues, and Humanity, Rethinking the Ethics of Human Rights, which we've been looking forward to. You may be aware that in, in a few days, on December 10, it will be the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human, human Rights. Now, uh, I would like to note that this event is being recorded indeed and broadcasted live on social media. Barring technical difficulties, uh, we hope to make the recording available as a video and a podcast. For Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is LSE Human Rights. Uh, after Professor Hutchings' lecture, which will last about 45-50 minutes, 
I will pose her a few questions before turning to the audience towards what we hope will be a fruitful collective discussion, and we'll have about 40 minutes for that discussion. We will then move towards the reception we will organize in her honor, to which all audience members are warmly invited. Um, now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Kimberly Hutchings back to the LSE to deliver the Human Rights Day Lecture of 2023. Thank you. Thanks to Aisha for that very lovely introduction. Um, it's a great uh, honour and pleasure to be here. Um, and thanks also to Marvich and, and Laura, who uh, have been instrumental in getting me here tonight and looking after me. Um, it is great to be back at the LSE. It's great to be giving the Human Rights Lecture. Back in the day, I was on the steering committee of what was then the Human Rights Centre yes. um, and uh, chaired that for, for a brief while and very much enjoyed working with colleagues who were very much specialist in, that, in um, that area at that time. So what I want to talk about tonight is very much in the realm of ethics. I'm talking about ethics and ethical theory. It's an argument about what ethics means and what it means to engage in ethical theory. So it's not a legal or a sociological argument, although it necessarily raises questions about the relationship between ethics and different domains of social practice, including law. For many critics of human rights, it's not universal human rights as an ethical language that's, that is the problem, but the double standards with which human rights norms have been applied. In contrast, I want to suggest that there are actually deep ethical problems with the predominant ways in which the morality of universal human rights has been understood uh, within the literature on international and global ethics, which is one of the main areas um, in which I work. So to give you a sense of where my argument is going, uh, so that uh, uh, you, you, you know what the destination is, even if all the details of trying to get there don't quite uh, come across as clearly as I would like, uh, the shape of the overall argument that I want to make is that I want to claim that the power of human rights as an ethical language, insofar as it has power, can only be understood when we provincialise and politicise its meaning. In this respect, I'm inspired from several different directions, including by quite a lot of scholarship that has been uh, gone on at the LSE. Uh, for example, Sumi Maddox's work on vernacular rights cultures, but also by decolonial uh, um, ethical work, Mako Mutua's uh, book, uh, a groundbreaking book from 2002, criticizing human rights from an African perspective, has been one of the sources that has been influential on me. Uh, but also some of the arguments around pluriversality, which I will touch on um, a, a little in the course of my work. And in addition, work of, of political theorists such as Brooke Ackley, who very much locates the power of human rights firmly in resistant political activism. So I'm trying to make an argument about where the power of human rights as a language comes from, as an ethical language, but I want to say it's actually precisely through dismantling in some ways some of the frameworks within which the morality of universal human rights has tended to be understood. The second claim I want to make, uh, and I may end up asserting this rather than being able to explore or argue for it in detail, is that in thinking about the ethics of human rights in this provincialized and politicized way, it becomes clear why human rights is unlikely to be successful as the kind of er language or the dominant language for addressing injustice in the world. Echoing Samuel Moyne's argument, I think it is the case that human rights are not enough when it comes to questions of structural injustice. This is partly because of the ways in which human rights individuate the harms and violations entailed in structural injustice and partly because I think there are inherent limits and ambiguities in the moral imagination of rights claiming. 
which tends to operate both as an enabling and empowering discourse, which gives those who are oppressed something to use in making their uh, struggles visible and in, in trying to resist uh, prevailing power relations. But it also always operates to protect uh, those who are in power or to protect um, uh, the, the position of those who may be being assailed, as it were, by, by the dispossessed. And that's not to say that an ethics of human rights is irrelevant to struggle over structural injustice, but rather that there are inherent limitations within that moral language. And I think we need to, to recognise that. Um, and increasingly, I think that is recognised, um, certainly within uh, the critical literatures that I'm drawing on. So as everybody knows, human rights have a history. Um, there's much argument in history of political thought, history of ethical thought about quite when that history starts. Um, but I am persuaded by the arguments of people like Samuel Moyne that it became an increasingly resonant moral and political discourse, particularly from the 1970s onwards. So you have the, the initial declaration, obviously, in, in 1948, but there is a, a a way in which that language gets um, sort of bracketed out because of the Cold War politics that dominated the next sort of 30, 40 years. So it's really in the, but in the 1970s, you start to get the use of the human rights language as part of struggles <laughs> against the authoritarian, authoritarian regimes, particularly in uh, Latin America. And after 1989, with the collapse of the Soviet bloc, in many ways, the language of universal human rights becomes a leading, possibly the leading, cosmopolitan ethical discourse within my own field of international and global ethics. So the idea of hu universal human rights is entrenched in literatures on the ethics of war and of intervention, humanitarianism, global distributive justice, environmental ethics, migration, the list of issues can go on and on. But the notion of universal human rights starts to do a lot of work mm -hmm. in those ethical literatures, particularly in the 1990s, perhaps uh, culminating in the late 1990s at the beginning of the 21st century. So universal human rights become a key reference point in moral thinking across different Western philosophical moral traditions of deontology, utilitarianism, contractualism, for example. Um, so deontology, uh, a moral perspective which stresses the absoluteness of certain kinds of universal principles and which is very closely related to the notion of, of universal human rights as capturing fundamental moral values that hold absolutely and can't be traded away for anything else. But even in utilitarian and contractualist uh, arguments uh, about global and international ethics, uh, what we find is a lot of utilitarian type defences of universal human rights as being a good way of maximising good outcomes and minimising suffering. And within contractualism, again, the assumption is that what rational choosers would choose in the equivalent of a Rawlsian original position is going to be something that would include uh, basic human rights within it. Now, these philosophical traditions dominate, continue to dominate, but certainly dominated particularly in the 1990s, the literature in global and international ethics. And these are all what I term rationalist ethical traditions, and they share certain characteristics, which I now want to go on and explore a bit more, in order to try to shed light on how the ethical language of human rights has been predominantly understood within moral theory, as a language of universal entitlement, protection, and regulation. A language which I'll try to show is embedded in and reproduces a key hierarchical distinction. A distinction between moral agents on the one hand and moral patients on the other. And I hope it will become clear what I mean by that distinction between moral agents and moral patients. So I'm going to go on now to explore these this way of thinking about ethics in this rationalist um, tradition. So the vast majority of work in international and global ethics follows traditions uh, within 
Western philosophy such as deontology, utilitarianism, contractualism, and takes the form of a kind of applied ethics. So these approaches operate with an epistemic model of ethical judgment in which the idea is to know what the right thing is to do, um, and which identify the ethical theorist as fundamentally a problem solver. And within this kind of technocratic framework, terms such as global or war or peace or humanitarianism or environment become equivalent to terms such as medical or professional or business in the broader literature on ethics. They are the source of problems for which ethical theory supplies or aims to supply the solution. Now, for these ways of thinking about ethics, fundamental ontological assumptions are not really relevant to establishing moral rights and wrongs. Not because this kind of theorising is unaware that there are ontological assumptions in what they're arguing, but because the ontological assumptions that they make are taken to be pretty much self-evident. And two in particular are taken as read. First, the ontological distinction between morality, which is understood as a realm of autonomy, primarily, of freedom, a distinction between that on the one side and on the other, nature and materiality, which is understood as a realm of determination. <coughs> so that's one key ontological distinction. And the second is the idea of moral equality as based on moral sameness across different moral subjects. Mm -hmm. And these two assumptions tend to reinforce each other. The cut between morality and nature puts all of humanity on the moral side of the ontological gulf with some you know, tricky demarcation questions when it comes to infants, those with severe uh, mental disabilities, people in comas, higher primates. There's a, you know, there's a flourishing ethical literature on all of that kind of stuff. But generally, it's very clear that humanity is on the moral side of the uh, ontological gulf, everybody else there, and everything else is somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Morality is taken to be specific to humanity, not because one cannot reason morally about non-human entities, but because only humans can reason morally. Utilitarian moral equality, each counting for one and non the, none for more than one, to quote Bentham, like Kantian respect for persons as never only means, but also as ends in themselves, both set humans apart and place moral significance in humans being fundamentally alike. Precisely because of the assumed split between morality and nature, however, the sameness of humans is identified with their capacities to reason and choose rather than their embodied existence. Even the desiring subject of the utilitarian is a moral subject because he or she can reflect on and order their own and others' preferences and make decisions on that basis. Within specifically human being, then, we find an echo of the morality-nature divide in which the peculiar qualities of the moral subject are related to stuff out there including their own and others' non-moral or immoral natures and capacities, but also the world of embedded habits, practices and institutions. So anything specific to us as moral subjects, as opposed to the general capacities to choose um, and, and to express our preferences and to be rational, are actually put into the realm that is like a quasi-natural realm. So what happens then is that all the things that are not that capacity to choose and to reason, uh, which includes not only nature but also the world of embedded habits, practices and institutions, all these become the object of the agency of the moral subject. So what I'm suggesting is that this way of thinking about morality relies on a series of ontological cuts between human being and other kinds of being between mind and body, between the individual agent and the world upon which he or she acts, which includes both the natural world and the world of embedded habits, practices and institutions. So, following this through, what are the kinds of 
existential assumptions about who the ethical agent is or who the ethical judge is within rationalist moral theories. The first thing to note is that in this mode of thinking about ethics, the nature of that agent is always doubled. It's both the moral theorist doing his or her work and certain protagonists within the real or hypothetical circumstances about which the moral theorist is reasoning. Classic question for the moral theorist to raise is what should X do when faced with a particular moral dilemma, such as whether to kill an innocent in order to save many innocents. In this kind of thinking, the choosing protagonist is the theorist's avatar and takes on characteristics that the theorist has or aspires to have. Typically, these are qualities of rationality, individuation, purity, and agency. The ethical agent and judge is rational in that he or she can understand and use moral principles and their implications and is not driven by affective considerations such as fear or anger. He or she is individuated as an integral and singular locus for moral judgment and action mm -hmm. and is pure in the sense that he or she is transparent to herself, able to follow the direction of reasoning and not be influenced by what is non-moral or immoral. He or she has a strong capacity for agency. He or she is able to act on conclusions about what it would be right or wrong to do. So ontological assumptions, existential assumptions. In addition, rationalist ethical theories <laughs> depend on a variety of epistemological assumptions about what moral knowledge is and how to get hold of it. First, they assume that the form taken by moral knowledge is universal. Claims about rights and justice, to the extent that they are true, hold across context, time and place. When it comes to how to acquire moral knowledge, rationalist ethics relies on the notion that there is a privileged perspective from which that knowledge is possible. Thinking from this perspective is not assumed to be easy. It takes sustained work to detach oneself from mere prejudice or tradition and make a viable moral claim. Part of this work is to identify key moral principles, such as fundamental rights, but also to engage with thinking about uh, questions like what is human nature, using rational inquiry. Uh, part of this is also using established techniques for advancing and testing out moral conclusions, for example, the use of logic, analogy and thought experiments. Unsurprisingly, given the existential and ontological assumptions mentioned above, such techniques are often methodologically individualist, identifying moral knowledge always with individual answers to the question of what the individual conscientious subject should do. For rationalists, moral theories are tools analogous to scientific theories. They provide answers to questions and means of testing out those answers through experiment and reflection, and then become action guiding. And just to give you an example of that, a couple of things from the sort of history of uh, uh, thinking in global ethics about humanitarian aid and global distributive justice, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with, um, where theorists like uh, you know, Honor O'Neill many decades ago made a very, very sophisticated argument uh, in favour of humanitarian aid to prevent and um, mitigate famine. But the way she does this argument is to base it all on a negative right of individuals not to be killed that is then unraveled through a variety of hypothetical lifeboat scenarios and then ultimately comes to a substantive set of arguments about what this might mean for policies. But the way the argument is developed is through taking a single negative right, which is taken to be uncontroversial, from which everything else then follows. A generation later, uh, Thomas Pogger does a very similar kind of set of moves in his arguments about global distributive justice, which are based on a notion of negative rights, a notion of the right not to be harmed. Um, so there's a, there's a set of techniques that are common within this mode of ethical theorizing, which abstracts out from context and which often uses um, hypothetical scenarios in order to try and grasp what the moral truth is that is at stake. So the point of ethical theory in this form is to provide criteria 
for what it would be right or wrong to do in general and in particular circumstances. In the same way our scientific theories are linked to the manipulation of the world, so too are moral theories. The point of knowing what is morally right is to do what is morally right. Classically, in the case of rationalist moral theories, this is often about institutionalising principles of moral conduct in law, which is obviously highly relevant in the context of human rights. So the task of the moral theorist is to help the conscientious moral subject understand what is right or wrong, just or unjust, and their responsibility to act on that knowledge. And this task is typically understood as involving the theorist in the development of arguments from a position of epistemic privilege, secured through reasoning and detachment from non-moral and immoral influences. The latter typically come from nature, unthinking passions, desires or drives, or culture, unthinking accordance with habit or tradition. Now, it comes as no surprise, I think, to the audience that critics have identified the ontological cuts on which rationalist moral theories rely with patriarchy and coloniality. Mm -hmm. The hierarchical binary distinctions between human as autonomous, nature as determined, between mind and body, subject and object, have been used to classify different human beings as more or less fully human and have underpinned the possibility of conceptualising what it means uh, not to be fully human, um, which in itself, if you're identified as not fully human, it makes you therefore a legitimate object of the action of those that are fully human. Women, the underclass, people of colour, have been regularly conceptualised as too close to nature or to cultural tradition, and thus at odds with what makes them moral subjects. Rationalist moral theory requires an uncontaminated mode of being human. But the idea of purifying human existence of heteronymous elements only makes sense if one assumes the validity of a fundamental distinction between free being and determined being. This distinction not only permits the valorization of mind over matter, it conceives of matter as necessarily passive, that which is done to as opposed to that which does. And insofar as social contexts are understood analogously to nature as a sedimented second nature, taking on the characteristics of objectivity, then these ontological assumptions also value the individual as the proper location of freedom and devalue relations of dependence, solidarity and community. Feminist and decolonial critics have pointed out that rationalist moral theory reserves the capacity for moral agency only to certain kinds of gendered and racialized subject. This argument is made at a more general and at a more specific level. At the general level, the moral agent is essentially disembodied and autonomous. The disembodiment emerges from the assumptions of rationality and purity, which both work to separate the moral subject from the constraints of nature, whether in the form of bodily desire or physical frailty. The assumptions of individuation, purity and agency speak to the moral subject's independence from others. This is a subject not internally connected to others, uncontaminated by culture as much as by nature, and able to act for themselves on the basis of individual ratiocination. As feminist and decolonial thinkers have long pointed out, the characteristics of disembodiment and autonomy are unevenly allocated to subjects within the Western philosophical imaginary. From Kant's subject doing duty for duty's sake, to Kohlberg's vision of moral maturity as reasoning individually in accordance with abstract moral principles, it is the privileged white male subject who answers best to the ideal of the moral agent. Kant distrusted the moral competence of Africans, women and employees because of their irrationality and dependence on others. Kohlberg argued that women did not achieve moral maturity in the same way as men. As is well known, those least likely to be referred to as subjects by some kind of gendered or raced qualification are white bourgeois men, who as the measure of the norm disappear from sight as somehow without any kind of disturbing ad hominem qualities. From the point of view of feminist and decolonial critics, then, the account of the existential conditions of the conscientious moral subject in rationalist moral theory are already gendered and racialized, even when it comes to their most abstract description. But the critique doesn't stop there. In more specifically interrogating the meaning of moral agency, critics have examined the ways in which different subjects figure in rationalist moral reasoning. 
The subject with full moral agency manifests itself in two different ways within this reason, reasoning. In the theorist's avatars responding to moral dilemmas in real or hypothetical situations, and in the agency of the theorist as rule maker. The avatars, those making the moral choices, are rational and effective. They have the capacity to understand and weigh up the meaning and implications of the values and first principles they enact. They're effective in the sense that they're able to be fully compliant with the requirements of the principles by which they are animated. Their actions make a difference, they change the world. The agency of rulemaking operates on a different level to that of the actors playing out the implications of particular first principles. It follows from rational reflection on the implications of the actions of agents and operates to confirm or to change the principles by which those actions should be animated. This is, of course, the agency of the theorist, uh, but also potentially of those to whom the theorist is speaking. Now, in contemporary rationalist moral theory, within global ethics and international ethics, theorists are generally careful not to explicitly gender the protagonists of their arguments and thought experiments, except in such a way as to challenge normative assumptions. And they never explicitly racialize subject positions unless explicitly addressing questions of racial discrimination. The point of their work is to find answers to the question of what it would be right in certain situations for moral agents to do. However, in order for this question to be raised and answered, moral reasoning constructs worlds peopled by competent moral agents and by those who are not competent moral agents in the fullest sense. The latter are actors that fail the requirements of rationality and effectiveness. They are the mistaken, the wicked, the ignorant, and the incapable. Without them, there wouldn't be any moral dilemmas in the first place. The relations set up between the theorist and morally defective subjects are imagined in different asymmetrical ways. Three kinds of relation are particularly common. Protective, for those who are unable to act for themselves. Educative, for those that are ignorant or mistaken about what it is the right thing to do. And punitive, for those characters that know the right but refuse to act on it. These imagined relations reflect a skew towards the perspective of those moral agents for whom certain questions are particularly relevant. Within global and international ethics, questions about, for example, criteria for intervention, about who should be killable and who shouldn't be, about whether there is an obligation to give aid to reform global governments, to redistribute wealth. Such questions presuppose asymmetrical power relations within the world, and they are addressed to the strong, who are strong in two interrelated sense, senses. First, in the sense that they are full moral agents. Second, in the sense that they occupy positions of power. Moral agency becomes identified with subjects that inhabit the world of dominant liberal powers and the capacity for moral action with the standpoint of the protector, the teacher, and the law enforcer. Mm -hmm. Moral defectiveness becomes identified with women and children, the global poor, criminals, and terrorists. From a feminist and decolonial point of view, the apparently neutral existential position inherent in rationalist ethical theories turns out to be mired in gendered, classed, and racialized tropes and assumptions. Now, in my view, as an ethical discourse, um, and the inspiration for ethical arguments across issues on international and global ethics literatures, human rights thinking has replicated the asymmetry between moral agents and moral patients that I referred to at the beginning uh, of the talk. Uh, something that's broadly characteristic of rationalist moral theory, but I think you find very much within, I uh, think, the ethics of universal human rights. The upholder of universal human rights as a framework for ethical thinking invariably reproduces the perspective of the protector, the teacher, and the law enforcer working on behalf of those who are, in different ways, inadequate moral agents. Now, of course, from the point of view of rationalist moral theory and a lot of the ways in which the idea of universal human rights would be defended on ethical grounds, feminists and decolonial critics miss the point. Um, it may be the case that in the past, and perhaps even now, there are patriarchal and colonial legacies and implications associated with rationalist <coughs> theories of universal human rights, but these are contingent features, mistakes that may now be corrected. 
These days, no moral theorist excludes black, poor, or feminine human beings from being acknowledged as full moral subjects. Rather, this is the kind of mistake we find in particularistic moral approaches, such as virtue ethics, for example. And anyway, aren't feminist and decolonial critics themselves drawing on moral values of justice and equality that can only be vindicated from this kind of way of thinking about universal human rights? If we follow the path of feminist and decolonial critics, then it isn't a danger that we break with morality altogether and cease to be able to critically interrogate injustice through the ethical discourse of human, universal human rights. Okay, so my answer to that is no. I don't think that necessarily follows. And I want to now move on to say something about that. How am I doing for time? About 20 minutes. You have, yeah. yeah. Okay. We'll see how we go. I'll, I'll shut up if we start going on too long. So I want to move on and, and say something about, well, you know, how would feminists and decolonial criti critics respond to that accusation from the more traditional ways in which the ethics of human rights have been defended? So feminist and decolonial critics are not only troubled by the ontological assumptions built into rationalist moral theories and ways of defending uh, ideas like universal human rights, um, because of the ways that it's played into a hierarchy of gendered and racialist subjects, they also take issue with those ontological assumptions in themselves. In somewhat different ways, and they are very different, I don't want to just sort of lump feminism and, and decolonial arguments together, they're obviously broad and highly internally differentiated categories, but for the purpose of this argument, uh, I'm sort of cutting across quite a lot of complexity. So they take issue with these ontological assumptions themselves. In somewhat different ways, they argue for an ontology in which there is no sharp cut between free and determined being, mind and body, subject and object. Within feminism, this argument is focused on the embodied and relational character of human being, including arguments as to the significance of sexual difference um, and the invention of sexual difference as well. These kinds of claims entrench ontological variety and difference, but not in a way that maps onto any sharp division between what counts as distinctively human and what doesn't. In the last couple of decades, different bodies of feminist work have argued on the one hand that free human being is inherently relational, we've got a lot of big literature on the idea of relational autonomy, and that nature, or the material world, is a site of agency as opposed to inanimate matter which can only be acted upon. Uh, we find obviously these arguments in the new materials literature. Now these are obviously not the same arguments, but they both make ontological assumptions that blur the sharp boundaries drawn in rationalist moral theory. These kinds of argument provide a very different situation for moral theorising, one which is much less friendly towards the heroic positioning of the moral subject as defined by their capacity to transcend their bodily existence and their historical context. Decolonial approaches, I would suggest, have opened up ontological questions in a more radical way even than some of the feminist arguments and really try to address the politics of ontology within predominant Western frameworks more profoundly. They've argued that Western philosophy, including moral theory, as well as science and social science, are all defined by the idea of a singular ontology, the notion that there is only one world. And when other views clash with this ontology, then they are either mistakes, emanating from backwardness, or more tolerantly different perspectives on the same world. In contrast, decolonial theorists have argued for a pluriversal understanding of ontology, in which it's not a matter of different perspectives, but literally of different kinds of world. And there are several implications of this argument. Most notably, it means that when one world Western views are imposed on others, this is not just about changing what people think, but literally about the destruction of the world. Second, it means that there are alternative ontologies to that predominating in the modern West, most of which do not make the same cuts between human and nature, minds and bodies, individuals and communities, self and other. In thinking about the ontological assumptions for decolonial ethical theorising, therefore, one has to take account of fundamental plurality and fundamental difference. There is no consensus on what it means to be human or on the locus of agency in the world. So it's clear that the existential assumptions implicated in feminist and decolonial ontological claims are different from those inherent in rationalist accounts from, of ethics. From the point of view of the latter, the feminist and decolonial moral subject is fundamentally compromised. 
he or she cannot be envisaged as rational, pure and individuated, and this means that neither can the moral theorists be positioned in this way. Instead, the moral subject is embodied, opaque to themselves as well as others, and intimately entangled with the existence of other being and other kinds of being. Within feminist ethical theory influenced by social psychology and psychoanalysis, one of the implications of this is that affect and emotion are seen to play a much more important part in moral judgment and action than is permitted within moral rationalism. Another implication is that rather than moral values or principles being derived from given assumption of individual self-determination, they are derived from the assumptions of relationality and dependence. In this context, care and empathy have emerged as having a much more central significance in developing moral values and principles than the articulation of rational grounds for judgment. Agency within this worldview cannot be about the exertion of freedom over against the natural or social world. It's a capacity formed and shaped by situation and is never a pure will breaking through various kinds of impediment. Similarly with decolonial thinkers, for them the possibility of thinking of oneself as free and equal is historically produced through the possibility of thinking of others as lacking <coughs> this capacity. And as Fanon pointed out, the situation of being affirmed as inferior through the gaze of others structures the ways in which one inhabits one's agency and embodiment. It's key, therefore, to decolonial thinking to move away from the idea of the human as the one whose existence is not qualified, the one who escapes gendered and racialized qualification. As with feminist thinkers, one of the ways to reconstruct the idea of moral subjects from this point of view is through overturning the established hierarchy and valorization of standpoint and identity. So we get a variety of standpoint thinking coming out of both feminist and decolonial uh, approaches. I'll skip that bit because otherwise I'm going to run out of time. If you start from the assumption of the embodied character of moral subjectivity and its identification and entanglement with other kinds of being, as well as other others, then you cannot reproduce the kinds of simplification and reduction of agents and situations characteristic of rationalist moral thinking. You'll be doing your moral philosophy, your ethical theory, in a different way. You'll be much less likely to understand moral knowledge as existing in isolation from other modes of understanding. You will need to grasp the situations you're trying to address in all their complexity. So you will need to engage with many other disciplines, for example, to get a sense of what poor, what war actually is or global poverty actually is. So how does one apply ethics if one abandons so many of the grounding assumptions of moral rationalism? Essentially, feminist and decolonial approaches encourage a different analogy for thinking about the nature of ethical theory. Rather than being about discovering the right moral principle so that we can change the world in the right way, ethical theory has to be thought of as itself a kind of doing in the world. Rather than being applied to the world, ethical theory is a product of the world just as much as are the actions, discourse, practices and institutions in which theorists of global ethics are interested. Moreover, it's a kind of doing that corresponds more closely to models of reflective or political judgment and action than philosophically dominant accounts of moral judgment and action. That is to say, it's about trying to persuade and create new agreements surrounding the question of what the world should look like, rather than being the epistemic advance guard of moral rectitude. Feminist and decolonial ethical theory, then, is ethical practice, part of ongoing struggles over how the world should be, but not a source of truth from which the problems of the world will be solved. Its arguments are self-consciously partial, stemming from the awareness of privilege and lack of privilege and the experience of and reaction to oppression and marginalisation and oriented towards but never guaranteeing moral transformation. And that brings me back to where I started, which is the need to provincialise and politicise our understanding of the ethical language of universal human rights. Now, I was going to say a bit more about this in relation to various arguments that have been made about the different, the three elements of universal human rights, so the, the, the human, the rights, and the universal elements. Uh, I won't go that into, into, I won't go into that now because I, I will run out of time. But I, I, as I said at the beginning, I'm, I'm inspired by a variety of work that's already gone on in which 
yeah, the human bit is not thought about in individuated terms, but of humans as being fundamentally relational, relational beings and related to what is not human as well as to what is human, so a kind of embeddedness, but also a sense in which the human is constantly redefined through the actions that people make in campaigning around notions of universal human rights. So it's something that's actually produced through people's relationships with others and with the non-human. Um, in terms of rights, as I said, I am very much inspired by Sumi Maddox's work, who has spent a long time researching how the concept of hack is operationalised by women's uh, resistance in different parts of um, India and, and Pakistan, and which provincialises the meaning of rights in one sense by showing us that there isn't only one sort of tradition for thinking about what a right is, there are many different ones, and that practices of rights claiming are constantly uh, reworking what it means to have a right. So that again, universal human rights is something that is produced through the on the ground work of these women <coughs> activists. Uh, and then in terms of Brooke Ackley's work, she talks about the universal uh, aspect of human rights and argues that we have to understand that universality as not in any sense of grand, a kind of pre-existing set of standards that somehow is written into natural law but rather as um, always particular. So the claim that is made in the name of universal human rights is always actually a particular claim. It's always part of a political struggle for her. So you can see the commonalities across mm -hmm. how I'm trying to think about those three concepts of human rights and universal. Just to finish, there's a but. Um, so I want to suggest that the, the ethical language of universal human rights, if you actually look at how it works, is something that works in a contextual and particularistic way and can be enormously powerful in different contexts, whether you're talking about elite contexts of advocates using that language to make arguments in the UN or whether you're talking about very grassroots contexts. But it can be extremely powerful. And we only really understand its power if we move away from the traditional ways of trying to think about ethics and about what moral agency means and how that sort of assumptions, how those assumptions about moral agency correlate to a set of assumptions about those who need to be acted upon, as it were. So I do want to suggest that the language of human rights remains a very strong and powerful ethical language. But I also think it cannot be the, uh, the only or the dominant ethical language for trying to address certain issues in world politics. Mm -hmm. um, one reason for this is to do with structural injustice in general, um, the failure really of the um, agenda of social and economic rights to deliver mm -hmm. yeah, anything of what they were intended to deliver when those rights were formulated in this sort of context of, of uh, you know, what was about to become this major decolonisation era and so on. And as with Samuel Moy, and I, you know, I note the way that within the ethical theorising about social and economic rights, there's definitely been a move to sufficiency, threshold conditions, notions of equality have kind of just gone out of the window. So it seems to me that the language of rights claims can do certain things, but it's not clear that it can actually address some of those deep structural issues, especially over time, uh, in terms of responding to historical structural injustice. But the other reason that I think there are sort of some limits to human rights as a, a kind of mode of moral imagination is that because if you look at the way that they work, they're always in some sense embedded in existing ethical discourse and practice. They require resonance with ideas about rights that are already floating around in the ether within whatever context it is that people are using the ideas. And I think, going back to something I said at the beginning, this makes them quite ambiguous in their implications. And I just want to read a little quotation, um, and then I really will finish. Sorry, I have talked for a rather long time. So this is from Mantua's book, uh, her human rights, uh, uh, criticism of human rights, that she published, um, they published in 2002. Um, so, while it was absolutely necessary to employ rights discourse to energise the anti-apartheid movement, it's important for the ANC to realise that the rhetoric of rights is a double-edged sword, a weapon but also a shield. 
Since 1994, all groups in South Africa, the wealthy and the powerful, the poor and the excluded, and even those who in the past blatantly violated the rights of others, have found either refuge or empowerment in the language of rights. As contradictory as their motives and intentions are, all of these groups seek to protect or advance their interests through the medium of rights. It's a testimony to the indeterminacy of this discourse that all these competing interests feel that the new constitutional order will protect them against each other and help them to vindicate their goals. So what I'm pointing to here is the challenge to any rights-based vocabulary from whichever tradition in terms of structural as opposed to individuated harm on the one hand, but also the question of whether rights-based thinking can do more than, and I think it does, expand our moral imagination. But can it go beyond expanding to transform our moral imagination, which is, I think, what the promise, in some sense, of universal human rights was supposed to be? And I'll finish there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that lecture. One would need to uh, read and reflect and listen to grasp the depth of what you just presented for us. I would like to bring us back to the current moment that we're in. And in the context of what we're witnessing in Palestine, for example, uh, how do we think about what you call the powerfulness, the powerfulness of human rights as an ethical language? In which sense are human rights powerful today uh, as that language? I pose this question as an acceptance of your invitation to politicize <laughs> the ethical language of human yeah. rights. I think many of us would like to uh, hear your reflections on the power or powerlessness of human rights in this very moment. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, a, it's a really good and obviously really important question. I suppose the first thing I would say is that I think what's going on at the moment precisely captures that asymmetry that is part of mm -hmm. a particular moral imagination mm -hmm. um, in which certain people are assumed to be somehow responsible ethical actors and mm -hmm. other people aren't. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this notion of those who can be acted upon and the, the language in which that's mm -hmm. been presented really uh, very much, I think, reinforces the problematic sort of um, uh, modes of moral universalism that have, have underpinned uh, human rights thinking. Mm -hmm. But I suppose what I would say is, is it so clearly, absolutely, political struggle in which all sides, both sides, are using mm -hmm. the language of human rights to try to make claims. Now, it's absolutely clear that for those in Gaza, it's not doing anything very much for them at all. Mm -hmm. But it is nevertheless a language that's being mobilised yes. by them and by actors who are attempting to act on their behalf. But similarly also, Israel is clearly mobilising that language too. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, for me, confirms the sort of... Um, the political nature mm -hmm. of what human rights are. And they're not always going, it's not always going to um, be a power, especially in this kind of highly asymmetrical top down situation, uh, which is going to work best for those who are most oppressed. And I think that then takes us back to the point about structural mm -hmm. injustice. So human rights may be able to do some work, mm -hmm. but it can't do the work that would fundamentally transform. Mm -hmm. The situation, either in terms of you know, mm -hmm. in terms of a vision of equality in which there aren't these assumptions about moral agents and moral patients. Thank you. Does that this sort of makes sense. Yes, it makes sense. <laughs> uh, I have a lot to say in response, but mm -hmm. I would like to turn to the audience to perhaps follow up or pose totally new questions. I saw this person first. Yes, the microphone is coming. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you so much. It's been very interesting. Um, I wonder about the politicization of the human rights discourse and the human rights practices. How do you weight uh, this invitation with the fact that uh, the uh, authoritarian 
uh, advances and with the authoritarian governments that are trying to dismantle all the all the human rights infrastructure and that they're, they're actually using that uh, that argument that human rights are from the left that human rights come from like some like that that they are not they're exclusive they're not for everyone and therefore they in order to make a democracy flourish they need to get rid of them so how how do you or what do you think about like these two sides of this uh, may I take a few more questions uh, yeah, or would sure. you like to no, no, okay. that's fine. Uh, I s yes and then one person in the back I saw and one there so I'll take four questions and we'll see is that okay you can Yes. yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Hutchings, for a great lecture. I had a question about the decolonial perspective that you spoke about, uh, the pluriversalist approach, particularly about different worlds existing and there being no one consensus on who is human and that the ontological claim of one rational being not holding up in different contexts. I was wondering whether this pluriversalist account, if it is to hold up, does it need to fall under the framework of cultural relativism, which in itself is a uh, kind of a colonial or a Western attempt to understand the native? So it, it's, it feels rather paradoxical to have a decolonial and a colonial uh, framework exist together within uh, at the same time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. One there, and I saw one there, and then we'll take a response. Yeah, we have time for a conversation. There. Please go ahead. Yes, over there. Is that Marie? Ah, sorry, yeah. I'm yes, so, uh, I, I, yeah. I thought you were starting on the other side of the room. Yeah. Thanks so much for the, the wonderful uh, lecture. I wanted to think about the implications of your, your argument, um, and, and, and I was wondering if what you understand as uh, a provincializing and, and repoliticizing mm -hmm. understanding of the ethics of, of rights discourse, if you would see that the, the very uh, turn to the granting of rights to non-humans, as we see in discourses on rights of nature, etc., if this is what you perceive as not only an expansion of the, the moral imaginary, as you said, but a transformation of it, or if, on the other hand, we are not uh, witnessing a reinscription of uh, the very uh, rational, moral, human agent that is now uh, granting uh, the category of subject to a personhood to, to non-human agents without um, acknowledging basically the entanglement and relationality that you were that we're speaking about. I'd love to hear your your thoughts about that. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. And uh, one last one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think my question doesn't add too much to the first and third questions now, um, but I just wondered that if you were re-theorizing rights in the, the ways that you're talking about, um, do you think that we would end up with a significantly different set of rights at the end of that? Uh, if so, what, would, what do you think they would look like, or maybe what would you like them to look like or include um, that aren't already? Thank you. There's plenty. Of <laughs> yeah. You can see it, my teeth into there. Thanks very much for, for all of the questions. Um, so the first one about authoritarian regimes who are dismissing rights as a you know Western invention and so on. I mean, th this is where we have to come to the question: is what are they for? What is it that we want? And it doesn't seem to me that. Um, the acknowledgement that uh, the ethical arguments around universal human rights that have tended to predominate in uh, the literature, which is what I was targeting, it, it doesn't seem to me to, um, to matter that uh, those arguments come out of a Western tradition. What matters is what is the political fight on the ground and what are people constructing by their invocation of universal human rights within that context. So you know, if one wants democracy and not authoritarianism, 
there may well be a role for that claiming of rights. But at the end of the day, it is a political contestation between two different ways of seeing political regimes. What I don't think you can do is say, oh, universal human rights are the right answer. You're just wrong. You know, you've mistaken. And if you just get this right, or we could take you to an international criminal court or something, and everything would be sorted down. Because I think that, you know, that is a deeper political conflict. Arguments about human rights would be part of that conflict. Um, absolutely. And there's a big history there as well, because social and economic rights are often you know, seen as having much more of a history in relation to uh, regimes that are, are now, you know, authoritarian regimes of perhaps a different kind than they were when, you know, when these arguments were first going on. So I suppose, you know, I don't think there's any straightforward answer in the sense of if you rescue universal human rights as a moral idea, which is somehow outside of politics, that will do any work particularly. The work is always done in the actual engagement between different visions of what you want the world um, to be. Um, yeah, the point about cultural relativism, it's, 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 a, it's one of those things that's very much at stake in the literature over pluriversality. So the, I mean, the argument would be this isn't actually about cultural relativism in which what people see as relative to culture. It's that people are in very different worlds. And of course, it's very much been... Um, the, the ideas very much come out of indigenous cultures specifically. So it is, it is the arguments about a different way of understanding what the human is in relation to the non-human, for example, as being embedded within. Uh, so the world that they inhabit is one in which the lines between the human and the non-human work in a different way. That's the argument. Now, is that cultural relativism? Well, maybe, and you're right, there's an anthropological set of issues uh, about that. But equally, the, the problem with cultural relativism traditionally is it still kept this idea that the Western way of thinking somehow was outside of that argument. You know, you have your cultural relative ways of saying things, but we know that Einstein was right, or whatever it might be. And I, th I think the point about pluriversality is it actually tries to democratise the argument between different ontological and epistemic positions, rather than to kind of shortcut to a solution by saying, the truth is here, this is the truth. Now, if you democratise, you may well find there's plenty of common ground which, which can, you know, in which people can come together, but it has to come out of that engagement. I think that, that's what the theorists who sort of argue for this kind of approach would say. I mean, I have to say, you know, personally, I am in, still in two or three minds about pluriversality arguments. I don't know quite where I stand, so, yeah, something we can maybe talk about later. Um, yeah, the granting of rights to the non-human, that's a really good uh, question and issue again. Um, I mean, I think this speaks to the point about there being certain moral limits on um, the idea of rights in itself and practices of rights claiming, that they always, in some sense, invoke something already known or they model the claiming on other claims that have previously happened. So in giving rights to the non-human, you're also, in a sense, reinforcing an existing moral imaginary in which beings are individuated and they hold certain kinds of rights and so on. Now, you know, I don't think that necessarily means that people who are making those arguments are in any way deliberately trying to reinforce an anthropocentric point of view. But it's very difficult to avoid that, I think, if you're using the rights language. And that's why I think rights language is very interesting because it can be pushed in lots of different directions and expand our kind of moral horizons in interesting ways. But it, it's somehow still tied to sort of notions of individuation, of, you know, existing practices that make it difficult for it to be a fundamentally transformative discourse, partly because of what Matter was pointing out with the way in which rights had operated in the post-apartheid South African uh, context. Um, yeah, and then it, the theorising rights. What I would not want to do is come up with a new list. You know, I really don't think that would be very helpful. I think it's much more about the fact that what's in the Universal Declaration or what's in various kinds of codes of what human rights are, when they're operationalised, when people are actually arguing about them or making cases about them, they take on a particular meaning, and that particular meaning can be really very varied and is, you know, doesn't necessarily approximate to the sort of 
what appears to be the hegemonic understanding of what a human right is. So I think it's more about the ways the, they take on particular meanings in practical contexts. Mm -hmm. May I follow up on the plural world? Yeah. Um, you summarize the decolonial uh, argument about Western philosophy as the statement there is only one world. Let me pose my question as a normative question. Should there be only one world where human rights are respected or even without the question of human rights? What is the source of your ambivalence uh, in relation About to About the one world. Yes, yeah. one world argument. One world or many worlds. Mm -hmm. I mean, I suppose one thing I would say is I just do not know what that one world would look like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'd need a bit more detail as to whether I decided it was one that I would eagerly embrace or not. But as a normative question, but you see, sh I sh should we not be living in one world where, s where certain values, I'm totally being polemical. Yeah, no, 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 I understand. Um, where certain values uh, are universal, where certain violations are unacceptable. Uh, why would one be of two minds about such a world? I think because, A, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it is very difficult to know what that would mean, but it, it depends how that one world, I think you can create one world, but I don't think you can treat one world as given. I see. That so, would be my point. Is the so, horizon of political struggle? Yeah, is, is open in many ways, but it could well be. And I think that's how, you know, uh, people like Brooke Ackley think about the universal in universal human rights, yes. is as that kind of horizon. And, you know, I do think it's true that in any ethical claim you make, you are in some sense invoking a universal, yes. but it's a, it is a universal to be rather than a universal that's already Mm -hmm. known and, and grasped, I think. So I don't have any problem with the one world as something that is produced mm -hmm. through contestation and agreement and, mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. between people. But otherwise, you do get into this, well, whose list? And it's not only that. There are so many clashes between the rights, even as we have them in the current declaration. So how do you side, decide what to give priority to? I mean, you know, the Cold War argument between mm -hmm. sort of negative and and positive rights is still a really live sort of, you know, tension within any kind of attempt to make human rights the, you know, the, the dominant moral language for world politics. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions that... Yes, please. Please feel free to comment as well, if you feel so inspired. Yes. Hi, Professor Hutchings. Um, I will just say a disclaimer that I'm not at all in this field, but I uh, was very interested to come to your lecture. Um, I'm particularly interested in your uh, criticism of the uh, I guess framework of human rights that we currently have, not really having the power to be transformative. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the discussion so far, uh, which has been really helpful for me to just understand all the different thoughts and players, uh, seems to be either advocating for the, well, the belief of transformative power at a later stage when we expand what those rights are or that once we focus on detail in a different way um, and on and on. Uh, and I tend to just be someone who dislikes the canon, doesn't want to expand it in terms of any type of change. So I'm wondering if you see transformation happening in the future, potentially, through any of the routes of argument that we've already pursued tonight, or do you think it's an entirely different mechanism? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very tough questions tonight. <laughs> uh, is there anybody else who would like to comment? I don't, oh yes, one hand there, I see. In the fourth row, yes. Hi, so kind of related to that question. Um, so you spoke about the limitations of universal human rights and international fora. So that means that we end up having to find recourse to international law, which is a lot less people inclusive. So I was thinking, do you have any thoughts on how we can have a more people inclusive future? 
Um, so basically, how can we add more substance to legitimate claims of structural injustice in international courts? Sorry, I didn't catch all of that. Perhaps a bit slower. Yeah, <laughs> did you read that? <laughs> yes. So you spoke quite a bit about the limitations of universal human rights in international fora. So that, what that means is that we end up having to rely a lot more on international law, mm -hmm. which is less people inclusive. So I was thinking, do you have any thoughts on how we can have a more people inclusive future in regards to the law? So in other words, for example, how can we add more substance to legitimate claims of systemic injustice in international courts? Thanks. Thank yes. I've got that this time. Shall I? Um... Uh, unless there is one more, perhaps one more, and that, yeah, thank you. Hi, thank you very much. Fascinating lecture. And my question is about you talked about colonialism, you talked about feminism, but I was wondering what are your views on class and on the current economic structures that we have and how they play with all these other paradigms. Thank you. Thank you. Again. Yes. Thanks very much for, for those questions. So, yeah, do I see the sort of transformation uh, as likely to, to happen? I mean, I, 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 think, I think probably not, to be honest. I mean, what, I suppose what I see is possibilities of incremental positive shifts, which is why I use that term expansion in a way, and I'm thinking of you know, grassroots struggles of various kinds where tapping into connections between uh, local and international discourses of human rights have enabled people to, to make progress around particular issues within their, um, within their societies or communities. And, you know, there, there have been some, you know, at least quasi-victories, I guess, in terms of you know, the move to recognise rights of first peoples and, you know, a, a range of things that have happened over time and, and that have actually pushed and pulled the idea of human rights in somewhat different directions as you get kind of group rights ideas coming into play, for example. But I don't really see um, a, a transformation as being like, likely. Um, I, think, I think you'll get some positive incremental change. I also think you'll, you'll continue to get this highly asymmetrical way in which the language of rights works much, much better for some people than for others. Um, and, you know, ironically, the ones for whom it works best tend to be the ones who actually need the least <laughs> help and support, as it were. So I suppose I'm quite pessimistic in that sense. Um, yeah, I mean, the limitations uh, that you know, you're asking me, I completely agree that there's a sense in which international law has come to stand in for... Um, other possibilities, because it obviously is a, a language which is very suited to um, rights claiming, and there are forums that have been set up where arguments can be made and so on. Um, and that in itself clearly has its moral limitations, because you do end up getting trapped in a very specific understanding of, of what rights are and of what it's possible to do, especially in a context in which enforcement mechanisms are so weak at the level of international uh, law. Um, I mean, I don't think I can answer the, the question about whether we might get, get something that was more inclusive and that would be better at addressing structural injustice. I mean, I do think here you've got to be talking about social movements and, you know, political action from those who are, you know, fighting the effects of the dominant discourses as, as they are. But... Again, I mean, going back to my previous answer, I'm, I'm not particularly optimistic about the chances of, of revolutionary change from the grassroots up. I mean, I think we're probably more looking at a kind of, I don't know, freezing of the mechanisms and of things falling apart generally, um, just to cheer everybody up. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, so I did, you're quite right, I focused on the uh, decolonial and the feminist uh, arguments in this case. Uh, but I do think class is enormously important, and that was why I was trying to say something about structural injustice. I and mean, one thing I think that Samuel Moyne isn't quite right about, I mean, he talks about how human rights has been quite effective at addressing status inequalities, but not really at addressing economic um, inequalities. But it seems to me you can't actually separate economic inequalities from what he's calling status inequalities, by which he means things like race, gender, sexuality, etc. I think they are very, very imbricated into each other. So I absolutely think that class is crucially uh, important.
Uh, are there any comments, questions? Yes, Mahesh. Um, yeah. Thank you, Professor Hutchings. I think every, everybody here really enjoyed uh, this fantastic lecture. Um, I wanted to ask you about, to reflect a little bit about the state and the nation. Um, and whether, you know, as part of decolonial, anti-colonial thought is of course the project of abolition, the abolition of borders and potentially the abolition of the state. Um, but as long as state structures and nation, nationalism persists, mm. does that not lock down mm. rights mm. Mm. as the only political or ethical mm. Mm. vocabulary yeah. possible? I mean, that, that's a really good question. And I think that actually is why, in some ways, I think that what can be done is incremental within a rights language rather than anything more fundamentally transformative. Mm. I, I, do absolutely agree. And actually, abolitionism is, you know, one example of a, a much more radical ethical discourse, um, which would, you know, overturn what is, I think, in and of itself a colonial form, that the state and the kind of nation that sort of uh, has become its kind of other. Um, so yes, I think I agree with you that it, it's, it's extremely hard to move away. And because there's kind of states and nations and then there's individuals and, and those are actually the moral categories that people seem to be able to operate with and, and, and that are enshrined within you know, the structures that we have at the moment for addressing injustices. And that means they are going to be heavily limited in what they can do. Um, yeah. You mentioned during your lecture that human rights reproduces the law enforcement framework, and I uh, wonder if that critique could connect to the abolitionist uh, critique of rights discourse, the state-centeredness, and whatnot. But I wanted to ask about the relation of the teacher, uh, the educative relation mm -hmm. that human rights establishes towards a conclusion. What are the implications of uh, the thinking you presented us with tonight for human rights education. Uh, what we do as teachers, what we, how we approach the subject as learners, scholars. Do you have reflections on our vocation? Yeah, I mean, in, in relationship to the, um, the first point, I mean, I do think the law enforcement model absolutely links back to the mm -hmm. point about the yeah. statism and so on. There's no question mm -hmm. about that, I think. And towards the positionality, which is not acknowledged of so much ethical theory around human rights, which is actually mm -hmm. the positionality of people within a liberal core who are making certain yeah. assumptions about the state, about international law, and about those who are able to make judgments and those who aren't. Um, and the ones who aren't may need to be sort of rescued or they may need to be protected or they may need to be punished or they may need to be or educated. educated. Exactly. Yeah. So, and the educated thing, I mean, what I was thinking of there was particularly that kind of 1990s language of norm entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and, you know, the kinds of, uh, you know, what we've got to do is when, you know, if there's a peace settlement, part of it must be sort of education in human rights norms or whatever, you know, it became very much part of that sort of civilizational language of humanitarian mm -hmm. intervention and so on in the 1990s mm -hmm. and, and responsibility to protect um, as well. So I was thinking of that more than of people who teach right. <laughs> human rights. But, I, I mean, I, I suppose... I mean, it does seem to me that teaching is, um, carries with it a, a huge ethical weight of responsibility. Um, and what is really important is to open things up and not do what I did today, which was to lecture at you with mm -hmm. you know, my views about um, human rights as an ethical discourse, but to actually enable people to sort of see how that discourse has appeared in different ways, in different forms, has been institutionalized mm -hmm. in different ways. The genuine tensions and battles within, as it were, the human rights community, where this is the kind of key language, but also the way that those vocabularies operate in mm -hmm. grassroots um, contexts as well. 
but, but to allow, it, it does seem to me to be really important to allow people to navigate their way through what is now, of course, a, a highly complex mm -hmm. uh, terrain enshrined in human rights and, and not to, um, not, not to do the thing which I think universal human rights language has sometimes done, of taking a shortcut to moral superiority. I, th I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are there any responses to that from human rights students? Yeah. There are many <laughs> in the audience. Or any concluding questions, comments, exclamations? If not, I thank you very much. Please join me in thanking <laughs> Professor Hakim for coming. Thank you very much.